Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully a couple more people will jump on, um, but just to be respectful of everyone's time and thank you so much for being flexible with the little mix up with the, the link. I copied two links together and then realized that it wasn't working. So um, I appreciate everyone's patience with that. Um, so, and can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and it, today is an especially small um, day. We had our first two small group meetings yesterday. We had about 15 to 20 people on, on each of those groups. Um, this group does have a similar amount of people, but I know there are some people who had soccer practice. They had a coach and all of that stuff. So um, they're still a part of it. They're just going to watch the video and um, work with the share drive and everything like that. But I think you guys should be able to see my screen. Um, so this is just a quick agenda. So I'm gonna start off with some housekeeping items and then we'll go straight into the discussion and um, talk about the next meetings. Um, let me bring up, I always feel like we need a little slideshow. Um, so yes, this is our first small group meeting of group C, rural population um, and culture. So um, I don't think I need to say this, but be respectful of everyone's opinions. Everyone's coming from with different experience backgrounds, um, but we're all here for a, a good reason. Um, just for a reminder, those are the other small groups. Um, some of the housekeeping items I wanted to mention is that you should be able to access a share drive now or a share folder. Um, so you guys are group C. Um, so it's just two documents in there now. Um, and one of the things I wanted to housekeeping item is that unless um, you have any reservations in doing so, I am gonna put everyone's name and email address. And if people want to, then they can add um, their phone number or email. But I wanted you guys to be able to reach out to each other. So um, you know, if you guys connect on the specific issue on the group chat, you guys can continue the conversation um, outside these meetings. Um, it's also a great resource for sharing information, studies or articles or anything like that. So I will actually, minimize this for a second and bring up. So this is what it is. Like I said, this is the group members in here. Um, and I see Janelle already put her name in. Um, but this, yeah, like I said, unless you have reservations, I'll go ahead and upload everyone's name and email. Um, and then this is the resource links, which I find super helpful. So I put a bunch in here, but that doesn't mean I'm the only one who has to. Anyone in the group can put any links or um, anything that they think would be um, good inspiration and good talking way to get conversation going. Um, so the first eight are ones that I've shared with everyone. And the next three are specifically ones that I put on here that I thought had a little bit more to do with what this group is discussing. Um, so just a little focus on rural education. Um, so these are just shared on here with you guys. Um, so for the special education group, I shared some more of the special education resources with them. But if you guys are interested in that, happy to share anything with you guys um, just to keep it organized and have a great resource for you guys to share information between each other as well. Um, so yeah, that's basically the housekeeping stuff that I wanted to go over. Um, today, what I really wanted the discussion to be is to start to talk about what are the hurdles um, what are the kind of issues? What are the areas where you see for growth that you actually see? So I want us to identify um, what you guys see as the biggest problems facing your communities or other communities. Um, and then where are we looking for solutions? Um, so start to talk about that as well. And one of the things I really wanted to reiterate um, from the first meeting is thinking outside the box and being creative. I think sometimes we get stuck in the, the formula um, of this is how it works, this is how it's always been funded. Um, but let's think outside the box whether that's being inspired by what other states are doing or trying to be a leader and thinking, you know what, I don't see a state doing this, but maybe this could be a good path for um, Montana to go down. And the last thing I wanted to mention before we start the actual discussion is that we don't have to stay on topic. Um, all these things intertwine. Yesterday I said we had the special education, we also had the teacher retention group talk and there was a lot of issues that overlapped because special education has a hard time recruiting teachers. Um, so a lot of these things intertwine um, and at the end of the day, it all comes down to the funding, right? So um, don't be afraid to get off topic. Um, I think all of this will lead to you know, some productive and some creative ideas. So 
I am going to stop talking and stop sharing my screen um, so that we can kind of start our discussion. Um, and I really wanna turn it over to you guys, like I said, to start identifying some of the biggest hurdles that you guys see or some of the biggest areas where you think growth um, could happen. And oh, so me before that, would you guys like to introduce yourselves just real quick, just name and maybe a quick fact about you or, or what you're really interested in? Sure, I'll start. Um, I'm Janelle Beers, and um, currently I'm the director of the Montana Small Schools Alliance, which is a group that works with about 150 of the smallest schools in our state. So we provide like the standards in the library and counseling for schools that don't have enough students to be able to have a librarian or a counselor and professional development and those kind of things. Um, I retired after 40 years as an educator, teacher, administrator, all those things. So um, education is just part of my life and small schools have always been part of that. So. I'm Diane Whitmore and uh, I'm the district clerk at the Olms School. I'm looking forward to retiring in December, so we have a new clerk coming on board. I probably should get her signed up for some of these uh, Zoom meetings. It might be helpful for her. She actually isn't starting until August, though, so. But she'll, she'll need all the training she can get. I know that, so. Yeah, and... Um... Just I know the clerk job in particular is it can be very difficult and there's lots of reporting. I know I don't have to tell you that. So if there's anything that she needs, um, I can connect her with some of the people here that really focus on kind of like the different systems and the reporting deadlines and all of that. So um happy to connect her. I know there's there's a lot of new clerks coming on board. So thank you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Christina Dirksen. I uh Moved here from California. Promise did not bring their politics with me. Swear. <laughs> we moved out of there to get out of there. We moved out of there when I was pregnant with my oldest, who just turned eight last week. And then his kindergarten year, he went to uh, public school in the town that we live. We live in a very small town in Montana. Um, and it was a very horrible experience for him. I'm not going to go through the whole detail, but the last two months of school, his kindergarten year, he was talking about being nothing but a bad kid and he didn't want to live anymore. So we yanked him out. I've been an executive or a chef for 15 years. I'm now a stay at home mom and I drive three hours a day to get them to private school out of town. So that's why I'm here because I feel like that should never happen to anybody. And if I can help fix it for other people, that would be great. I have no intention, no matter how this turns out, to take them out. I now have three children in private school, but I have no intention of taking them out. But it would be nice to drive three miles to the bus station and drop them off and be able to feel satisfied and comfortable in them going to get their public education we pay taxes for. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where I'm at with this. If there's any suggestions or anything I could do to, um, help facilitate that or give ideas or think outside of the box, because I come from a different, um, demographic in the culinary world, I might have a different take on how these things can be handled. Yep, exactly. And, and that's what we're looking for. And I know, um, this group is a little bit broad, right? Because, um, you know, teacher retention is a little bit more drilled in and we have some groups that are just, you know, looking at specifically the budget formula. And this group, I, I really think since Montana has the the most one room schoolhouses still left in the country, Nebraska's number two, I think it's really important to um, have a focus on some of our smaller and rural schools because um, Billings and Bozeman and they have a large voice. So it's I think it's really important to make sure that when the legislature is looking at any changes that they take that into account of how it's going to affect their bigger school billings, but also how it's going to affect our smallest schools. Um, we don't want any of the schools um, to have any negative effects of, of any changes that they're looking at. So um, I guess really, and you guys all have really 
I, I would say diverse, but great experience. So um, I wanted to start identifying some of the biggest issues that you guys are facing. So really anyone can take it, um, but I really want this to be an open forum where we just start discussing the issues and then we start to drill down on how we can find solutions to those issues, whether that be obviously more funding, that's what everyone's talking about, but also creative ways that there's more flexibility or anything like that. So um, I, I would love for someone to kick it off with some uh, an issue they see. So um, being that I currently have kids in the school system now, um, no matter what anybody says, there's always going to be the conversation of people need to be paid more, people need, um, you know, more of a budget to facilitate that. I'm sure that is going to be, you know, the number one topic. And then there's also a reality of it, because that means more taxes have to be paid to facilitate that budget. But coming from my standpoint, um, I, I think that part of the problem, and I had employee retention issues, turnaround, being in the culinary field, I get it. I worked in Helena. I, even though I live in a rural town, I commuted, but I worked in Helena and trying to keep people um, on task and paying them enough to be able to afford housing and all that stuff is virtually impossible um, in this area. So I want to personally take that part off the table. I think the issue that I faced is that I, tr I personally tried to report the person who caused my child harm. I've, I've finally just been able to get in touch with, is it, does she pronounce her name Elise or how does she, the superintendent, how does she pronounce it? Sorry, I forgot I muted myself, Elsie. Elsie, thank you. Um, so Elsie finally reached out to me, but I've written letters. I've made phone calls. I've, um, contacted newspapers to try and get this person removed from the school system. And that person is still there. And so Elsie got me in contact with a lawyer for the state of Montana and the process that you have to take to report, there's no human being who would have ever been able to navigate this information without the help of some person at the top level. So he, you have to click here, go here, click down here, find article 1077, fill that out to perfection without a single spelling error, without a single T uncrossed in order to even file a report. So if we have, I'm, I'm not the only person who has an issue with this particular person. I know many who do. But if the process is this great lengthy scenario that you have to try and figure out on your own, then how are we to know who, what bad doings are being done? If there's no way to report the situations and if you have no idea what's going on in the school or how children are potentially being abused mentally, physically, emotionally, however that may be, how can a problem be fixed if there's no way to report the problem? I think what you're talking about is making sure that, you know, there there's accountability and there's ways for parents to um, actually file issues or a little bit more smooth, or, I guess, um, of a process for parents to be able to at, at least be able to raise concerns in a formal manner. So someone's yeah. actually looking at it. Yeah. Because that, that domino effect takes place in the, in my opinion, in the program, because if you have a kid who's depressed and angry and upset and feels they're being treated unfairly, and in my case, wanted to die at five years old, how is that affecting the education process? Are they being able to focus and learn what they're supposed to learn? So if it starts there, in just my case in particular, if it starts there, how many other things get affected along the way in the education process as far as that being a distraction from their education? Sure. No, I, I definitely know. Um, I understand, well, one, where you're coming from, but two, where you're going with that. Let me check. Um, and I'm not sure if there's been any like kind of legislation regarding um in previous sessions just kind of about formalizing kind of like a process like that in a little bit more of an accessible way for parents to like i said and be heard in a, a formalized 
a manner that you don't feel like you're just shouting into an empty room, right? Um, so you feel like someone's actually looking into it. Andy, one of the things I wondered is if you can explain um, like the small school sort of funding, like, I don't know, they don't call it a correction. Where I came from in Oregon, they had a small school correction where if you were a smaller school, you got a different amount of money um, based because you couldn't run all the programs with you know, 10 students that be required to do everything. So you've got a little bit different funding formula and, and maybe Diane knows this too, being a clerk, but how that formula is arrived at. I mean, I read what you sent out. I just didn't really see how it explained it in layman's terms, I guess. <laughs> well, I guess, well, there's a couple different ways. So there are some rural or small school um, funding grants. So I know that this is not going to answer your question in a simple way. And I'm, to be perfectly honest, I'm not a funding or budget expert. So if you're looking for a very specific breakdown, I could definitely try to pull that from some of the people who are better at this than I am. Um, but so there's the, one of the things that they use is the guaranteed um, tax base. So, and I, I the GTB ratio. So that's one of the ways that, so if you have, and this can help also larger districts too. So it's not just about the smaller districts, but it's about having maybe that smaller tax base um, to make sure, so the D GTB ratio is like, they actually times it, and I don't remember the exact amount, but I could send it to you. They actually, like there's a whole like equation and they times it by a certain amount to make sure that if you are a small school district with a small tax base that you get a little bit extra help, or if you're a big district with a small tax base, the same thing. Or on the other side, like you're not gonna get quite as much help from the GTB ratio. If you're a small school but have a large tax base, um, maybe there's a lot of resource development in your, in your school and it might be small, but you still have a lot of resources coming in because you have an industry to tax. Um, and then there's also some rural, like I said, there's some rural school grants um, for those smaller schools. So there's like a number of things that kind of and tentacles that go in the pot to assist with that. Um, and then when you start bringing in like the special education, obviously the smaller schools are not going to be able to have all the the staff to be able to provide the services that certain special needs kids have. And that's why you end up having like the co-ops, right? So the schools all it's the money that would be going to the school ends up yeah. going into the co-ops right to so that they kind of share um those special service teachers does that kind of answer your question i know that was very broad it does i just didn't know if there was a standard percentage that but it, you explained that with the tax base so it really depends on where the small school is yeah it does um like I said, I think like Ekalaka has, they have a lot of more research, a resource of specifically oil there. So they have a small school base, but they don't need quite as much help because they have so much like money coming in from other, other revenue sources. Um, one of the, uh, just to kind of get the ball rolling on some stuff, and it is because it's fresh in my mind, talking about teacher retention and special education. What do you guys find as kind of the biggest issue to retain teachers are? Like, is it, you know, uh, maybe the housing quite isn't, isn't quite as expensive in some of the rural areas, but there's a lack of it. Um, or do you, are com people complaining about healthcare um, benefits or access or price? Or is it just like, it's the salary period? Or is it, I, I mean, I know it's hard sometimes to get people, you know, if you have a husband or wife that has a job in Helena, um, you may be willing to take that more rural job but the commute just isn't possible because your spouse has a job in, in an area that's more, or their job is more locked into that area. So what do you guys find as the biggest hurdle for recruiting and, ret and um, retaining teachers? We've been pretty lucky in Ulm as far as teacher retention. We 
actually have been very lucky. But part of it is because we are very close to Great Falls. I mean, it's only, we're only 12 miles out. I mean, it takes you as long to drive out to Ulm as it does to drive across Great Falls. So as far as the, you know, the commute, that's really not a problem for our teachers that live in Great Falls. It's not a bad drive. And um, you know, it's only a couple times a year that the roads are bad in the winter. You know, they they clear those roads pretty quickly between Great Falls and Helena. So um, that's not a problem. We went to a four day school week and our teachers and our families love it. Um, you know, we we thought about it for a couple of years and we thought it would be a hardship on our families, but it really isn't. They absolutely love having the four day school week. Um, in order to get our hours in, we do work a couple of, we, we do have um, student instruction a couple Fridays throughout the year, just so we can get our hours in without having to extend the calendar into the month. But, um, so, you know, I, I really think a lot of the rural schools should look at the four day school week because our staff loves it as well. So I think that's part of our retention. I know a lot of our schools have the four day school week and they really do talk very positively about it. I think besides pay, which I mean, you know, some of our teachers in some of these small schools aren't even, you know, making like twenty four thousand dollars. I mean, they're just it's terrible. But besides that, is the isolation factor? You're the only teacher in the school, and you don't have anybody to balance things of and those kind of things. So, if there was a way to maybe somehow we would try to do some of that too. Um, but you know, team people up, and I know they've tried to do that with some of the college programs, as they have like a mentor teacher that you can talk to and things like that, because. You really are out there on your own <laughs> and uh, there isn't like you can't walk down the hall like in a bigger school and talk to the teacher in the room next door because there is no room next door kind of thing so isolation is a big factor I think. And I know it's not the same as maybe having someone in person but do you think having mentorship programs that kind of bridge the the small schools together so yes they don't see each other um, but they're at least they get connected to say like, hey, when you're having a tough day or you wanna try something different in the classroom or you're whatever, um, do you think maybe incentivizing a mentorship program across schools would be like a, a good idea? I do, yeah. I think MSU has a program like that that they're, yeah. that they have going, yeah. Yeah, yeah so we, um, that's in, um, in partnership with the OPI. Um, and it's it's relatively in its infancy. It started, um, it was launched in 2021. Um, it had their their first round had 17 students in it and their second round had 20 something. Um, so it's slowly growing um, and, and we're kind of adjusting the program to make it more enticing for the students to get involved and also make it conducive to their, their schedule of, of actually graduating. Um, but it's been a really great response so far. Um, people have really enjoyed that. And um, it lets those kind of student teachers kind of, they're able to hit the ground running once they actually graduate because they've actually had time in the classroom. And it's not, it's scary to get in front of any group and it's scary to get in front of some groups of kids. So like it, it's good for them. And it, they really have talked about how it, it's prepared them really well and they feel like they're, they're ready to go. Um, but I think expanding that and possibly expanding that in a way where we bring those smaller schools together uh, um, would be a great idea. Um, so I know housing is a big thing that's uh, out here, uh, just for an example. So if you, know, you get paid a certain amount, you can't afford to find a place to live. I get contacted from... I've gotten contacted from multiple states. I've gotten contacted from New York, California, wanting me to, to be an instructor in their state for culinary arts and restaurant management. <clears throat> and the first thing I do is look at the cost of living. Okay, so for what they're gonna pay me, can I afford to live there? 
And the answer has been a resounding no. Not that I plan on moving anyway. I always just like to entertain the idea. Well, it's the same here. So for example, living in Townsend, Montana, I live by Canyon Ferry by the lake. Um, my four bedroom, two bathroom, 20, 50 square foot home on an acre and a quarter, according to Zillow, and I live here and it's laughable, according to Zillow is worth over $500,000. Who can afford that on a $40,000 a year salary? With that said, I can look out my window and see half a dozen vacant properties that have houses on them that nobody lives in all winter long. It doesn't, people don't come back to the specific area I live until Memorial Day and then they leave after Labor Day. And then those houses are empty. This is the out of, out of the box thinking, and I know this is going to sound crazy, but crazy is what I do. What if there was some kind of incentive for the property owners who have these vacant properties, even though clearly they don't need the money, to maybe on the cheap lease out and or rent out those vacant spaces? Because I know that my town isn't the only small town outside of you know, rural areas that have this housing crisis, but also have all these vacant properties that sit empty for whatever reason, whether like my neighbor across the street, they have a house in Three Forks, but they don't come and visit this home across the street until the summertime. What if there was some kind of incentive for the homeowners in those areas, like um, a break on their property taxes or um, some kind of discount somewhere that they can obtain and in return, the teachers who cannot afford to live anywhere can rent it for very cheap and maybe sign a contract to help maintain the property while they're gone, keep an eye on it, make sure you know there's no vandalism, not that uh, ever happens anyway, but something, I'm just trying to like put the, that piece together, like something that would incentivize both the homeowners who live here and or who have vacant properties here and the people who actually live here but cannot afford to live here and or even people draw people from out of state to teach during the school season and then they can go back home to wherever it is they live during the summertime when school's out no, I think that's great out of the box thinking. And it's not that out of the box or crazy. One of the things we were talking about yesterday that a gentleman actually moved here from Colorado and he was talking about a program that they have there. Um, it's different, but um, just it has to do with when they're building new housing, that some of the housing is actually reserved at a lower price for like teachers, firemen, police, things like that. Um, and then they're only allowed to sell it at a certain like increase of the property, like obviously property across America has gone up crazy, but in Montana, it's been very acute. Um, so they're, the price is actually, and they're only allowed to sell it to someone else in that. And I'm not sure, like, it's just talking about ideas and who knows what the legislature would want to do. But I think it's a, it's a great idea to, to think about those things and, you know, just have a buffet of, of ideas um, that we can hopefully pass on the legislature to consider. And some of them may strike out and some of them they may love and some of them they may not pass this session, but could pass in, you know, a couple years from now. Um, so I, I don't, what you're talking about is not that crazy at all. Um, one of- Can I oh, just sorry, say one more thing? Sorry, I apologize. Just to add to that, um, another idea I had had years ago is that a lot of the people who own properties out here do live out of state which of course they don't live here. And so that creates this um, vacancy in the properties that actually do exist, but also um, drives up the housing market. Um, a few years ago, I had had an idea and I don't know if this is legal. It's just an, it's just an idea, but that maybe um, people who live out of state pay higher property taxes. And I mean, like not a small percentage, I mean, like in, you know, two, three, four percent. And then that percentage that they pay extra can go towards um, 
building um, reasonably cost housing, such as your friend from Colorado, the, the gentleman from Colorado mentioned, or paying higher teacher salaries so they can afford to purchase a property or rent or live here. Um, so just taking chunks of that extra percentage from out-of-state people who purchase properties here but do not live here, do not contribute to Montana, and divvy that through things that have to do with housing for that specific demographic. Well, that's not nuts at all either, because that's something I know that people in the legislature are discussing right now, um, specifically like second home. So if your main residence is out of state and you have a second home in Montana, um, that your property taxes could be higher. And um, I know that's something they're discussing. So you're, you're, I think, on point with things that people are looking at currently. Um, one of the things I also wanted to ask is that with especially with smaller schools, sometimes the building maintenance, things like that, or possible on um, busing or um, food costs are a little bit more acute when you're serving a smaller um, population. So I was wondering if like Janelle or Diane, if, if that is a, if you guys see that as a particular stressor um, to be able to provide those services or maintain buildings, um, is that something that you guys find as a, as a larger problem in, in a smaller district? Yeah, we do, we really do struggle with our food program and our transportation. Um, <clears throat> I actually, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, quite often say, let's get rid of the, the transportation fund. Let's not even have transportation. Let's put it on the parents to get their kids to school. Um, I say it half jokingly, but the other half, I'm not joking because it really is an issue. We've been, once again, Alm is very lucky. We've had the same bus driver for 35 years. Well, I know she's going to get tired one of these days. And I know that um, the smaller schools are having issues with being able to hire bus drivers. It's just they're not out there. People are not looking for, for that split shift. And, you know, it, it's a struggle. There's no doubt about that. I would say that probably, I don't know, it's probably a good portion of our schools that don't have transportation. They, because they're so small, their parents bring them to school or, or they carpool. And most of them don't have lunch programs either. Um, but the building maintenance, I think that does continue to be an issue because, I mean, just something like the recent legislation with water, lead pipes and all those kind of things, you know, you've got to do some of those same kind of things. Or if you get a roof that blows off, then you don't have anything in your maintenance budget and things like that. So um, I think those are issues for our small schools. Um, and most of them are in older buildings there. I mean, I don't know anybody that really has a new building. So there's going to be those things always. And lots of them are in um, buildings that have multi-purposes. So they're not only the school, but they're also the community center in the evening and the other part of the day or some things like that. So um, I think maintenance is an issue for all of them. What school just had the roof blow off? It was it SCOBY or it was an S, right? Which, which town just had the roof blow off? Maybe it wasn't SCOBY, but I feel like it begins with an S. <laughs> but I, we saw that, we were, we were watching that. That was, that was a nutty day. Um, so like I said in the beginning, um, so my school, my kid's school does not provide transportation. So I drive three hours a day, but it's cause I'm a stay at home mom now. So I drive 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back, 45 minutes there, 45 minutes back. Um, I know this might sound callous, but if I can do it, other people can do it because I saw Helena was hiring school bus drivers and had sign on bonuses for $4,000. What if they had a tax incentive for like slowly divest the bus schedule? Like, okay, you know, 2025, we're no longer going to have buses. Not, you can't rip it off like a band aid. Parents will freak out. But however, if you keep track of your miles, at the end of the year when you file taxes, the state will 
give you a rebate back or um, some kind of tax incentive for the parents that for, for driving their kids to and from so that the kids, so that the parents don't end up with the mentality of like, okay, well then I'm just not going to send my kids to school anymore. Cause I know that's not the goal here from my um, emails back and forth is it's, that's not the goal. We want public schools to thrive. We want people to attend them and get, not get away from homeschooling and private school, but definitely that not be the go-to. So I don't know how much it costs to maintain the buses and the bus drivers and that. I, I'm sure it's a pretty big expenditure, especially when I'm saying $4,000 sign-on bonuses to just hire a bus driver. But what if we gave that money back to the parents for driving their kids to school? I, well, I haven't heard that idea yet, but in, in smaller, some of the rural school district, that might really make sense. Um, I mean, I guess what Diane was just saying, right? They 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 thought about it. Maybe maybe that's an option for some areas. And I, I think one of the things is that, especially in Montana, a one size fits all solution probably isn't going to work for every school district. Um, so maybe having the flexibility of allowing school districts to to have something like that. That's I'm always a big fan of flexibility. And like I said, using other states as inspiration is great. I think that's what's great about America. A bunch of states can try different things and states can copy each other or, or learn or learn hard lessons with actually, without actually having to go through it. So I think it's the same thing. It's a smaller version of that um, on a state level too. So some schools can be trying something different and, and it may work out and it could expand further. So um, something like that, you, we could always propose like, this is an idea, maybe it's a pilot program, something like that. Um, I know this is a little bit off topic, but it made me think of it. And I was thinking that maybe Diane, you would have a, a good perspective on this. So um, there's always been out of district attendance agreements for special needs kids, but now this is expanding this year for out of district kids to be able to basic or for kid, any kid to decide or I guess parent to decide they want to send their kid to another school district and I was wondering is that something that you guys are starting to see parents interested in of either leaving or coming into your school we've always had it we've always had a large number of our students are out of district out of district they come from mostly Great Falls um, especially the ones that live on the the outskirts of Great Falls mm -hmm. toward Helena. So um, we always, I mean, since I, and I've been doing this for 21 years and we've always had close to half of our enrollment is out of district. Um, and we don't charge tuition. We've never charged tuition. Um, we just considered the A and B to be what we get for those students. Um, I don't I don't foresee that now that anyone can as long as the classroom numbers allow can can come to your district um I'm not quite sure how that's going to work for the clerks that get to try to collect the uh the taxes on that the property taxes the from the other district, uh, that's gonna be interesting to see how that actually plays out. You might have to hire an assistant <laughs> that just takes care of that. You know, I just, I can't imagine it. But um, anyway, yeah, we, we've we always had out of district kids and, and has never been a problem. So really a lot of our enrollment the parents drive the kids to school anyway because they're they are out of district. They're out of our district, so there is no bus for them. So, um, anyway, it's it's going to be interesting how that all plays out. It, you just made me think. Of, I keep going down different paths, but talking about and I know two hundred three on um, the out of district bill. Um, it adds a lot of layers of, of things <laughs> for you guys to deal with. So just in general, and I'm sure Janelle, you can speak to this too, um, of the, I know, you know, a larger school district, yes, there's more students to take care of uh, or keep track of, but they have a larger staff to help with that. In the smaller school districts, do you find some of the 
reporting requirements or are there just like duplications of things that maybe the legislature can look at of streamlining it um, and maybe streamlining it in different ways, streamlining it differently for some of the smaller schools versus the larger schools. And is that administrative burden? I know it, it grows every year between federal and state and everything. And a lot of bills have really good ideas and, and, and they may be great in application, but they add a lot of administrative work. So is there anything that you guys see in, in that way that you think would help smaller school districts? Well, I, I can tell you that um, the AIM slash Infinite Campus, I think they're doing a great job at streamlining some of these reports that we've been required to do over the years. You know, the team's report being in the AIMS data, that was a lot of work this year, but down the road, it's going to make it easier unless they change it again. <laughs> You just get used to something and then they change it. But, um, you know, and it looks to me like the civil rights data collection is also being um, looked at pulling that data from AIM and Infinite Campus. Um, so I think that's great that they're, it seems like, it seems like you guys are trying to cut down on some of the reporting that we have to do that many of us have always felt has been redundant that that we've already put all this data in and now we have to fill out another report that has the same data in it it seems like you're you're working at cutting those re those reports back some so i appreciate that i i mean i'm probably not going to get to take advantage of it because i'm retiring but <laughs> you know, for for clerks down the road, I think it is going to make their life easier. I, I know there's some, there's a learning curve right now, I would say, but uh, that is the purpose of what they're trying to do. What OPI is trying to do um, is trying to streamline that. But a lot of that, the data, we're just a pass through, as you know, we pass yeah. it through to the state or the feds yeah. um, and trying to make that as streamlined as possible for you guys, for our teams here. Um, it, it's so it's a difficult thing, but um, I do think just that it, um, like I said, well-meaning things often come with strings that you're like, oh my gosh, there's all this extra stuff that comes with this good thing um, that yeah. makes it not as not as fun. Yeah, difficult. <laughs> yeah. And that's it seems like it's here. getting better. Yeah, that's kind of what I was hearing. There's a lot of hair pulling this year um, yeah, about you know getting those reporting pieces done. Um, one of the things that you mentioned was just with the, you know, the, like Diane was mentioning, they had a lot of students who are in transfers already and the unintended consequences of the new legislation and, you know, is it making work where it was already figured out before and now there's a whole nother piece that they have to put together that it wasn't necessary maybe. So, you know, the idea was good, but really is it necessary and, and is there some way to streamline that? And I think on other unintended consequence, I know at least one and probably two of our small schools um, probably will end up closing because um, they're losing enough of their enrollment that they can't stay open with, with the students that are left. Um, and one I know that is some kids that are going into probably Polson, so in that Flathead area. And so they're just they're probably going to close one of their small schools. And so that's, you know, that's a neighborhood school and and in a small town there along the lake. And then I think there's one other one that's in that um, same boat. So I just don't, I know from my point of view, the unintended consequence be that it's gonna cause small schools to eventually close because of it. And I know, and not the, I, know I mean, the smallest ones, not the ones that are, you know, like the kind of in between, but those, those are really those one room schools. Um. One of the things I was actually talking to one of the legislative staffers about specifically with 203 is that prior to this bill, it was basically agreement between schools. Now the schools are required to actually send the physical like signed agreement to OPI. And 
the legislature didn't tell us what information they wanted from it. So we're collecting these things, but nothing technically to do with them. And it creates an extra level of work for you guys to send it to us. And um, so I was talking about to them specifically on that bill of how like maybe in the infinite campus system or something like that, can they click a button like saying that we have an approved agreement, but without self giving us a physical copy, which just creates data problems. It creates extra work for you guys. And like I said, we're collecting it, but we don't technically, the report that we're required to send back to legislature, we don't need all the information on there. We just need to know like what, where the student is going from, like this district to this district. We don't need all that extra stuff. So I've actually was talking about trying to at least streamline that tiny part. Um, oh, Caitlin, I saw that you just joined on. Um, I don't know if you just wanted to quickly say hi and introduce yourself to the group. Hi guys, I'm so sorry. I coach my son's soccer team on um, Thursdays, Tuesdays and Thursdays, so I just wrapped that up. Um, I am Caitlin Hall. I work at Roberts School. I'm currently teach sixth grade and I'm the instructional coach for our seventh through twelfth grade. But a lot of that has also involved um, working with our budget and looking at our financials and I think like a lot of Montana schools right now it's very very tight um another piece is that I'm actually going to a new school next year and um in a pretty what I would deem more wealthy district and they are still seeing a lot of budget issues so that kind of piqued my interest to see that you know not only is our rural class C school, but our neighboring class B school is um, also really struggling with how we're working with our budgets and um, a lot of the constraints that are involved in that. Well, Caitlin, I want to give you a chance to speak since you were joining on, but just to like kind of recap, we were kind of talking about the different costs that rural schools have to deal with that may be more acute. So um, some of the transportation costs, but we also talked about like the tax burden, um, and we were talking about just administrative burden and all that stuff. But um, today what we're really trying to do is kind of talk about some of the bigger issues that we're seeing um, and start to narrow those down so that we can hopefully start to figure out some possible solutions. So um, I just wanted to see if there's anything in particular that you see um, that your school district um, or maybe your new school district is struggling with. You know, I, I would say for Roberts, there's there's so much, but um, we're kind of in the middle of it right now, right? We, like we just had a levy fail. So the tax burden um, on our community is far too much. Um, they, they can't afford that, right? Like there's a lot of people on fixed income, um, high populations there. Um, so they can't afford any added costs really. Um, and then teacher retention, we're one of the lowest paid districts and, you know, in the lowest paid state. So there's, there's that problem as well. And so to retain teachers who can teach at a high level, it's really difficult right now. We have five teachers who commute from Billings. So 45 minutes to an hour, um, on decent roads, that's not sustainable, um, the cost of living, obviously, that's outside of probably the scope of this. But, you know, in order to be able to live in a place like Carbon County, um, teacher pay has to be a little bit higher. So so there's, you know, there's that. We've been, um, we've, we received a literacy grant. So we're just sort of starting to see we're so, sort of on like the edge of a lot of this difficulty, because we've had such an influx of cash with ESSER funds and with the funds from our literacy grant that, you know, hopefully we'll get that again. Um, hopefully Montana will, will get that again. But um, I, I think our two biggest are, you know, keeping, keeping teachers around and um, figuring out a way that we can fund our schools without having to go to our communities that are really, really struggling already with, with these increased taxes and assessments. Well, and it didn't help that everyone got the little extra property tax bill right before the school elections. Um, it's no wonder that they all failed. I mean, not all, but most of them failed. Well, people just received an extra bill 
you know, on top of what they've already paid. And well, heck yeah, they're going to vote no on a levy. You know, what, what do they, th they should have waited a month before they sent those extra bills out. <laughs> that was bad timing. And um, we didn't request a levy, but um, it was only because I failed to have the amount ready at our board meeting. <laughs> we had intended on requesting a levy and, and the clerk failed, <laughs> but it wouldn't have gone through anyway. <laughs> uh, this just made me think of something because there were bills last sessions to bring um, school board elections in line with the regular kind of federal like elections, state legislature elections. Um, and one of the things that I heard some complaints about with some of the failures of the levies um, was the low voter turnout. Um, and one of the arguments to move it to an on cycle is that like more voters actually turn out. It's less confusing that you have an election than a couple months later you have another election. And I was just like curious, I know that's very off topic, but it was something I saw discussed in the last legislature. And I was just, it, it kind of ties in because at the end of the day, do you want a higher turnout and more voters bought in um, to approving or or not approving of the levy? So I was more curious just on your person, on your guys' personal thoughts on that. <laughs> I have a friend joining me. <laughs> you go sit in the back seats. Um, our, our turnout was like 33, 38%. So, I mean, that you know, I think that kind of goes back to a lot of the problems I was talking about a minute ago with living in Carbon County. It's, it's it's very expensive and a lot of people have these second homes. So they're not necessarily here and that's hard to get that buy-in too. But I, you know, I teach social studies. So I'm like, yes, more civic engagement, but that might lead to, you know, lower ratios of people voting for, <laughs> for the levy. So it's a good question. Mama, I'm hungry. <laughs> Anyone else? Any opinions on that? I know it was off topic, but I was curious just to kind of see how people are feeling since it was an issue discussed in the last session. <laughs> well, when we do have a school election, which quite often we don't because we don't usually have enough candidates as far as a trustee election so that that part of the election gets canceled. But um, I think it would be helpful if it was run the same time as the the primaries or the general election. Um, I think it would be helpful if they were just on that same ballot or even if it had to be a separate ballot, I'm not sure how that would work, but. It gets, I guess, what a, it gets a little confusing with some of the district lines, um, but there was also, because um, there's other, there's tons of elections, as I'm sure you guys are aware of, or just things to vote on. Um, so there's other like specialty districts and stuff. So I know one of the arguments against it was the complication of like making sure the right people get the right ballot, depending on, on the district lines. And it's also extra confusing right now because all the legislature lines are changed too. So, um, but I, I mean, tons of places do it. So I'm sure it's overcomable, but it's just, it's an interesting thing. Um, I, I think having more people bought into the process, um, I think is helpful, especially if you're if you're talking about raising taxes to fund schools. You want as much of the population to feel like they're bought in, and that their tax dollars are going to a place where they feel they have some accountability. So it's just an it's an interesting thing to talk about. And I know Caitlin, you brought up um, teacher retention. That was something we were talking a lot about. And um, I know we started talking about different possible if we're looking to put more money into our school system. Um, I'm a legislative liaison, so I'm trying to be in the mind of the legislators of what they want to see, what they want to hear. If you come and be like, we want more money for something, they're going to be like, where does that money come from? And I know technically right now we have a surplus, but who knows in five years we may not. Who knows what the economy will be like? Um, so I think that's something that our, our group should start getting into. And I know we're wrapping up our time here soon, but just I wanted to see if anyone's initial thoughts on if you're looking at places to take get revenue from, and I know Christina already talked about possible, like an extra tax on second homes for out-of-state people. 
but things like that, um, because as you saw, people are, are feel the the burden of uh, their property taxes right now, and they voted down levies all across the state. So are there other things that we could look at or suggest to the legislators of like, hey, maybe this is an area you could look at where more funding can come from? Um, one of the groups yesterday, there's a lot of pot money, right? With all the dispensaries opening up and where is that money going? So one of the things I'm pulling for them is more information on how that, where that tax is going, exactly where the lottery, um, the earnings from the lottery is going and how it's funding schools. But is there any ideas or anything that you guys are, are thinking of maybe creative or if, is there something that you'd like to, like I said, I'm pulling more information about how that funding goes and where it goes. Is there anything you guys would like more information on, on like where school funding is coming from and where it could come from? I mean, I like all of those ideas. I'd love to know where the more about the marijuana funding. I've read that some of that is earmarked for mental health funds. Um, but it seems like there's a substantial amount there. Um, and we lived in Colorado for a weird amount of time, right when that a lot of that passed um, and kind of saw some of those shifts or I guess read about them. We'd left by that time. But um, on the second home note, and it wouldn't work for every county, but um, you know, there's a lot of specifically VRBOs. So not just you know, people using their homes um, for themselves, but also, you know, creating income from, from those as well. And there's a lot, you know, that's created other issues in a lot of places as well. Um, but I don't know if that would be an avenue that could be looked at. Um, they've done any economic studies on that. <laughs> well, I know, um, there are in some states where they've created greater restrictions or possibly have taxed them more. Um, and I'll have to double check because I know somewhere they may have went a little too far so much that they like shut down the market basically. I knew New York was having that problem, New York City. Um, but I'm sure there's been places where you could find that balance maybe of where they pay a little bit more, but not so much that you're getting rid of the existence of them or the ability for them to be there. But I think that's definitely something we can look into. I've, I've wondered myself, like with the amount of income that Big Sky generates with, you know, billionaires that live there and build those homes. And obviously they're not living there um, permanently. Um, I've read many articles in the news about, uh, and my kid's dad used to work up there as well, doing spray foam insulation for these homes and not being able to afford to live in the town that you work. Um, I am not saying this is like a tax the rich incentive. However, I wonder how much of that income that's generated at Yellowstone can be trickled down to the people who work there or the schools that um, the people who actually live here take their kids to, um, because it's, I mean, the, the wealth in that area is more than probably anybody could possibly imagine in a million, cabillion years and 10 generations. And it's there now. So I don't know, hold on, honey. So I don't know if there's some kind of like that could something that could be done for that specific area, because those people obviously love it here. They're building huge mansions. They um, have the money and they're taking all the benefits from Montana, but what are they contributing to this state that they love in return? And there's some, like I, I mentioned in the beginning, so there's the GTB ratio. So some of that is, is partially done, right? So in those areas, like they're, they, if their school district does not get as much state funding as other districts that don't have that tax base in that industry. But that's one of the things that we can talk about too is adjusting, possibly adjusting that formula, right? So the GTB ratio could be adjusted in a way um, where those school districts may get even less of the state dollars and more of those state dollars flow to um, school districts that have a smaller tax base. But those are all things that we could look at because it's partially done. 
And most states do have some something along those lines that's done in different ways, but most states do have a way where um, some of the tax dollars for schools flow out of those the wealthier areas to the poorer school districts. And our GTP ratio, like I mentioned, it is not just based on the tax base, it's also based on how many kids are in the district. So I mentioned Ekalaka. I always say that town name wrong. I don't know why I cannot say it right. But um, small school district, um, very rural, doesn't need as much of the state assistance because of the industries they have. Um, one of the other things I'm pulling for some of the districts, and I already have this breakdown, I just have to pull it and send it to them, is how some of our resources are, are how that income flows to school. So oil, um, lumber, stuff like that. Um, some of that automatically goes to the school districts too, but that's something we can look at as well um, of just how, how much of that money is coming in um, and how much of that is then earmarked or goes to school districts. And these are all things that we could talk about of adjusting because sometimes you adjust something by like one percentage point that can make a big difference for, for a school district. So, um, well, uh, I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We've been on here for an hour. So, um, I know I mentioned a couple other things and I'm pulling for other groups. Is there anything, any information that I could get for you guys that will, I think, help spur creative juices or something that you're interested in? Um, and you don't have to think of it now, but you could tell me right now too. But if you think of it over like basically the next month, just shoot me a note. And then, um, Caitlin, one of the things I talked about, and you should have a link to the share drive on there. There's um, a spreadsheet in there and there's some links that I've shared with all the groups. And then there's some links that are specifically geared towards rural education. But if you guys, if you want to add anything in there that you're like, hey, this is a great article or something I saw, um, throw it in there so everyone can see. But like I said, is there anything that you guys can think of at the moment that you would like more information on? I mean, I, I, do, I would I like to, to, oh, sorry. Um, I don't know if you, most of our small schools, I would assume, apply for the SRSA grant um, through the Department of Ed. And this year, it was so much easier than it has been in years in the past. It was a matter of just checking radio boxes, pretty much. Um, I think I had to put the GEPA statement in there, but uh, it was super easy this time. And and our little school usually every year gets about twenty twenty five thousand dollars from that grant. So um, I suggest looking into it because it definitely is is easier than it used to. It used to be super easy. I didn't have to do anything <laughs> and we just got it. Um, then they changed it and it turned into quite a cumbersome form. But now once again, it's just a matter. It took me maybe 15 minutes of hitting radio boxes to apply for it. So it's a good thing to look into. No, that's a great thing of note. And we're trying, we OPI puts out a lot of communication and there's so much on our website that it can be overwhelming. And, and specifically talking to you guys that work in the schools, if there's any recommendations you have for us to better communicate some of this stuff. I know we have a lot of virtual trainings, but sometimes people don't even know that there's a virtual training. Um, and sometimes, especially the new clerks, don't even know where to ask, where to look, where to go. Um, so, and I know there's a there's always a lot of turnover in clerks. It seems like this, the last couple of years and the years that we're looking forward, there's gonna be even, there's a 50% turnover. Um, so if you guys ever have any recommendations that I for OPI of how we could communicate some of those things better, because sometimes schools just miss out on funding opportunities that they're eligible for. But we can't give it unless they fill out the form because that's statutorily required by whatever entity created the program. Um, so whenever we can do anything to improve like that customer service level that makes sure that all the school districts are taking advantage of it and get it in on the deadline. Because sometimes things have just, I mean, some, they're, ar they're not arbitrary, they're set in statute, but sometimes I see ar arbitrary because they're like, why is this due right now? Um, so if there's any type of input you guys have on that, I'm always happy to pass it on to our team. Katie, I'm just wondering what the, um... Katie. Sort of like the temperature is of the legislature to make a change in this regard, like with school budgeting. I mean, are you seeing like a lot of momentum that 
that's well, what our representatives you know, are are looking for or are they really you know I mean I'm sure they're aware of some of the crises that a lot of the schools are in but um kind of what are you seeing as far as that goes well besides this legislative session we also have the decentennial like budget so this is like a big time I think where there's actually an opportunity they, they may be more willing to adjust things I, I know they are looking at it seriously it's hard to gauge their appetite level, right? right? If they just want a snack or if they want the whole meal. Um, so it, it, they could make little tweaks around the edges and or they, could, I, it's hard to do a full overhaul. And I would just say for, for perspective, like I've worked in a number of states. Every single state talks about how their formula is broken. So until fi a state finds that magic ratio that everyone can copy, um, it is always like, it's always hard to find that balance. So we'll see kind of what their appetite level is. Um, I've been in contact with specifically the education um, staffer up there and he, he was on our first big meeting. So he's paying very close attention to like the ideas and stuff that come out of there. And when I talk to legislators, they're always looking for new ideas. And that's one of the things I've talked about with some of the other smaller groups is like there's the big picture ideas. So fully changing the budget formula or they're smaller ideas. So I, I think it's good to give them, I'll keep using food analogies, a buffet of options um, where maybe they take some small things now. But I think it's always good to put those ideas out there, whether big or small, they may not happen this session but it starts that conversation of more people looking at it and discussing it. So um, in some ways your guess is good as mine, but I do think that there is an appetite there to do something. How big that is, we'll see. Well, I wanna be respectful of everyone's time. Um, I took notes during this, I also recorded it. So I'm gonna jot down some things that I think we can probably dig into more. And hopefully next small group, we'll have a couple more people on because there's about 20 people in this group, um, but life happens. And, and thank you so much for Caitlin for jumping on. I, I, I know it, it's hard to work these things around people's schedules, but I know you're taking personal time out. And thank you everyone for your patience with me as we do this. OPI has never done something like this before. I don't think any really agency or anything has done it actually like tried to bring in the community to like, let's talk about these things. Um, I think it's a good time to do it. I'm hoping that this will continue to be a trend to bring everyone together and actually um, talk about some of these issues. And I think uh, like a lot of people come from different perspectives, but we all have a very similar goal. We might have a different path, how we want to get there. But um, I, I appreciate everyone's patience just kind of as we do this for the first time. So any, other, que any other questions or anything for me? Otherwise, just shoot me an email anytime. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy your night. Yes, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate being able to be a part of this. So thank you very much. Funny awesome. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs> Bye.